Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. Today is double upload day and in this video I'll be going through my favourite Game Week 6 wildcard draft and some of the other players that I would be considering on wildcard and then later today we're going to have my deadline decisions video. So if you're excited for all of that content, please do drop a like on the video, make sure to subscribe as well, but without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, let's jump into taking a look at this Game Week 6 wildcard draft. And just to reiterate, I'm not on my wildcard this week. I am wildcarding in Game Week 7, like 90% sure. I just think offsetting it by one week makes sense for my team. But if you are playing it, it's a very good week to play. And if you are on the fence, I really do like it. I will just comment on the fact that everyone's wildcard draft seems to look the same. And whilst that is a little bit boring and from an enjoyment perspective, I don't love it. Being template and having a similar wildcard draft to other people isn't as bad as it sounds. Because realistically, even if more people are playing the wildcard than we think, and it's even up at like 40 to 50% of people playing the wildcard... All of these template players, like a Semenyo that lots of people have, even if they're owned by everyone on wildcard, that's still less than half of the game. And you have to remember that it might feel like everyone has the same wildcard, but that's just amongst very engaged managers. There will be a lot more casual managers out there that maybe don't watch as much content and aren't involved on social media that would have very different wildcard drafts. So I will often talk about the template and the fact that I find it a bit boring when everyone has the same team, but it's always like a over sensationalization of what it is, right? It's not everyone having the same team. It's just those highly engaged managers all arriving with very similar picks. And the thing is, there is a template for a reason. It's not just because content creators or just because of models. It's because they are probably the best set or pool of players to choose from. And so I really do think there probably are only like 25 to 30 players that are really, really good for this week. But don't also feel like you have to go template. So there is this fine line of, I don't think you should go different just for the sake of going different. But equally, don't feel like in two or three spots in your 11, you can't trust your gut feeling and go with a slightly more unique player. And so in this draft, I have got a few different players. Firstly, just to give you something fresh to talk about. But also, I truly think this draft is good. So the, the places that I've gone different isn't just for the sake of being different. Hopefully that makes sense. But I feel like people often go too far in each direction. They say the template's like this really dirty thing. Like you don't want to own the same players as other people. And then some people go in the complete opposite direction. And they are like they refuse to own highly owned assets. So I think you probably want to be somewhere in the middle. And probably the best way to play the game, and I always say this, is to just ignore ownership. If you think a player that is 99% owned is going to score points, own them. And if you think a player that is 0.1% owned is going to score points, own them as well. So that's probably the correct way to play is just to completely ignore ownership altogether so there's that little ranty section over about ownership and kind of the template this team for me I have minus 0.2 million in the bank and you're probably saying then why on earth are you showing it to us I just think that my team value at this point in the season isn't fantastic I know it says 100.9 but team value is different to selling value and if I sell all of my players because I have money tied up in certain assets it's probably not as good as it looks. Like I don't own Erling Haaland. So for me to put Haaland in a wildcard draft, that takes a lot of my budget. So I think what I'm saying is I've I've checked with a few other people that are on wildcard and they can afford this. So I think a lot of people that are on wildcard can afford this. If you can't, there are loads of places that you can possibly downgrade in this team and we'll discuss that throughout. Very rambly start to the video. This wildcard draft is rated at 96% according to Fantasy Football Hub. You can still get a free team rating, by the way, if you're building a wildcard right now and you want to get that rated. There'll be a link down below to Fantasy Football Hub. And this is the final week where you can get 50% off as well. So if you want to get access to all of the stats that I use in my videos, player comparisons, fixture analyzer, expert articles, and much, much more, this is the final chance to get 50% off. There'll be a link down below in the description. If you are going to sign up to Fantasy Football Hub, this is the best time to do it. And I still do highly recommend it. It works out very cheap with the 50% off and it's something that I use absolutely every single day to help me with fantasy football. And despite my rank not being very good now, it has helped me a lot in recent seasons. So starting with the goalkeeper, this is one of those positions where I genuinely think you can go different. And again, not for the sake of it. At the moment, I'm recording this quite early on Friday morning. We don't have a definitive update around Raya. And whilst I think there is a good chance he's available, I don't know that right now. And if we continue to not have definitive information about his availability, after Raya, I don't know that there is a real standout keeper. And even with Raya, the thing is, he's very expensive. And the only reason that he's been so amazing thus far this season is because he's made so many saves. And people keep telling me that Arsenal defence are unbelievable. 
If they are that unbelievable, they won't continue to concede as many shots. It will go back to what we saw last season where they barely conceded any shots. I think it was like less than two saves per 90 right average. It was about 1.6, 1.7. And if that's the case, he's still getting six pointers, by the way, which is brilliant. But he's not going to get in those nine and ten pointers. So I think you need to almost lower your expectations with Raya that what he has done thus far this season is an absolute joke. He's getting clean sheets and save points and bonus points. And I just don't think it continues at quite that rate. I'm not saying he's a bad pick if he's fit and available. I just think that even Raya himself, I don't think he's such an auto-obvious pick. And like I said, even if you do think that, after Raya, let's say you want to go for a double attack instead or you like the idea of picking Saliba, I don't think there is a standout keeper. Most people will go to Fleckham, and there's a, a few good reasons for that. I believe Flecken's made the most saves so far this season of all goalkeepers, definitely up there. And the fixtures are actually really good for Brentford coming up. My concern with Flecken is I don't think Brentford look very good defensively. And whilst that does mean that he makes a lot of saves, it also means clean sheets are far less likely. And you need really saves and clean sheets. You can't just have one or the other. It's why Edison and Riot in the past weren't great options because clean sheets alone aren't enough. And it's why other assets that make lots of saves but don't keep the clean sheets also aren't great options. It's why you wouldn't go for like a newly promoted goalkeeper very often because the clean sheets probably aren't there. So you do need the two of them. And I just worry with Flecken. I just don't see Brentford keeping many clean sheets at the moment. That being said, last season, they were sixth for expected goals conceded. So if they can start to improve their defensive data with the nice run of fixtures, because let's be honest, they've had very difficult fixtures. If that data does start to improve, then maybe Flecken is the standout. But a, a player that I like, and you're going to say, hang on a second, you've just said Brentford haven't been good defensively, and you've got Jordan Pickford. The reason for Pickford is Jared Branthwaite is now fit and available, and it sounds like he might play this weekend against Crystal Palace. And even if he doesn't, if he's back for this run now, obviously Everton have very good fixtures as well. And I just think that Sean Dyche will find a way, especially with Branthwaite coming in. We saw this last season, over the first six or seven Everton weren't particularly good defensively. And then Branthwaite just shored up that defense and they just become an absolute monster of a defense. So as long as Branthwaite can stay fit, I do think that Everton will improve. But they do also concede a lot of shots and that's what makes Pickford a good asset. Pickford was brilliant for large spells last season. So I quite like the idea of going slightly different here. And not again, not for the sake of it. I just think Pickford could be a really cheeky option. He's at 4.8 million now, by the way. He's had two price falls. It won't be for everyone. And I can understand that based on the way Everton have performed this season, you might not want to go there at all. I've actually got three Everton in this draft. Please don't cancel me or click off the video. But obviously, I have uh, McNeil and Mikalenko on the bench, as I'll discuss a bit later. But anyway, I really think Pickford's a good option. Outside of Raya, Flecken, Pickford, you could go for Sells if you think he'll continue to keep his spot. There are other assets you could go for. I've seen some people looking at Edison, given that Sissy's fixtures coming up are pretty good. You could even go for an Allison if you want a double Liverpool defence. But... I think for me, probably Raya and Flecken are the two standouts that a lot of people are choosing between. But I would just chuck Jordan Pickford in there as, as another option that I think could do well over the coming game weeks. Final thing on goalkeepers, because I've rambled for way too long already. Don't be too fixated by fixtures because you have to remember this is your wild card. And you're probably not going to play your second wild card. I would say until at the earliest between game week 26 and 30. That's probably the next time you'll play your, your second wild card. And so as a result fixtures don't really matter unless you're planning on making several goalkeeper transfers and attacking fixtures because you're going to have this goalkeeper for the next 20 weeks in which time they're basically going to play every other team or every team at least once so it, it for me doesn't matter as much fixtures it more matters save points clean sheet potential and how much you trust the defense moving forward so i'll put all that together i think pickford's a fine option in the defense, I'm not going to talk about Trent and Gabriel in a lot of detail because everyone's going to probably have them. And these are two picks that I probably wouldn't go against. Trent, there is the justification to go for a Canate or a Robertson instead of Trent, given that he's so expensive. And I understand that. But I would just want to have Trent in there. I don't think anyone gets close to his attacking threat. His bonus points potential is always very good. And Liverpool have shown how good defensively they've been thus far. And people keep pointing to the fixtures. And I would say... The next five fixtures, from a defensive perspective, they don't look great. Wolves have been attacking quite well. Palace, I think that's actually an okay fixture. Chelsea have been attacking extremely well. Arsenal, even without Erdegaard, will score goals. And Brighton are a decent attack. I don't think there's more than two clean sheets there in the next five for Liverpool. But I don't know that. And we saw last season, Arsenal kept so many clean sheets against very, very top teams. And Liverpool have improved defensively. What's to say that Liverpool can't keep a clean sheet against Chelsea at Anfield? Like, you just don't know. And also, because of Trent's attacking threat, the clean sheets are good, but they're not everything with him. So, 
I still love the idea of having Trent. Trent would not be someone that I'd be willing to sacrifice on a wild card. And then Gabriel, I would go as far as saying Gabriel would be my favorite Arsenal pick. Ahead of Raya, ahead of Saka, ahead of Havertz. Gabriel's got the clean sheets. His bonus points potential has been slightly better this season, by the way. Still not as good as Saliba, but it's been slightly better. And also, he's just got that attacking threat. And I still maintain that you are not getting goals at the rate that he's showing you right now. Previous seasons, he scored three goals, three goals, and five goals across the last three seasons. Even if you expect that to increase slightly, let's say that he gets a career high of six goals for Arsenal in a season. He's still scored two of them. So you're saying in the remaining... 32 weeks, he's going to get four goals. So a goal every eight games. I mean, you might say he's going to go out there and get 10 plus goals, which might be possible. But I guess what I'm saying is temper your expectations. You're probably from a defender, even with attacking threat like Gabriel, probably expecting a goal every seven or eight games. So he could get that next goal against Leicester and he could make it three goals in a row. But with Gabriel, he is still the most attacking for me, Arsenal defender. And he is probably the centre back in the league with the most attacking threat. So you get a defender with great attacking threat, a slightly better chance of bonus points this season based on what we've seen from him. Fixtures are there and clean sheet potential is extremely high with Arsenal. So Gabriel, Trent, really obvious picks, but also fantastic picks as well. The remaining three spots, I think a lot of people are going for Greaves. I own Greaves in my actual team and I do think he's probably the standout four million. So Greaves is there. I would just say Vandenberg, if he can continue to nail down a place in the starting 11, I don't know if he'll be able to. Brentford fans, let me know down below. I still think he's a very decent shout as well. Whilst I don't think Brentford are great defensively, Ipswich also aren't great defensively. So I think Vandenberg would be the only other option I would be slightly tempted by. And then the other two spots, I'm seeing a lot of different people go different ways. You've got people going for Guardiola or Rico Lewis to cover that Man City defence. And honestly, if I had the money for Guardiola here, I'd be very tempted because I think his long-term minutes are extremely secure. And Rico Lewis... It's difficult to argue against Rico Lewis. His minutes with Rodri being injured are probably likely to be a lot better. Lots of people saying that Pep will rely on Rico Lewis to be that technical aspect of the midfield. Obviously, they've got the likes of Kovacic in there, Bernardo Silva that can play there too. But Rico Lewis is so technically sound on the ball, as well as naturally being a defender, you would imagine that if someone is going to fill in that role, not the exact same role as Rodri, but in that midfield, Rico Lewis could be the guy. In fact, the only game that Rico Lewis has been benched, I believe, so far this season was the one that Rodri started. So it could be that with Rodri out, Rico Lewis's minutes are extremely secure. And so it might be worth taking that risk on wildcard. But I equally realize that team value is an issue. And in this team that I've built, I was already struggling. As I said, I'm already 0.2 down. So I've got Ola Aina in there as my 4.5 defender. I just think that Forrest are really good defensively. Ola Aina is a bonus points monster when he keeps a clean sheet. And he does have a little bit of attacking threat. And also their fixtures coming up are really good. Fulham at home, Chelsea, Palace, Leicester, West Ham. There are three home games in the next five. Two of the away, the away, One of the away games against Leicester. Like, I think these fixtures coming up are really good for Ola Aina too. So I've got him in there as my favorite 4.5 defender at the moment. And then on the bench, I have Mikalenko. I know that makes a double up on the Everton defense. And I'm, I guess most weeks you wouldn't really want to play Mikalenko. But I do also think for, for 4.3 million, he's got some clean sheet potential. He should be nailed once he's fit and available. And the fixtures, again, are really good for Everton coming up. If you could potentially get a little bit more money... There is a really nice rotation between Ola Aina and Colwell. The two of them rotate really nicely for fixtures. And I think Colwell is a really nice 4.5 option too. So if you can do Aina and Colwell, I would probably slightly prefer that. But for me, I was already struggling for money. So Mikalenko makes his way in. So that is the defense. I don't think there are many other assets that I would desperately want to squeeze in. I think Rico Lewis is the key one outside of what I've got here. You might want to try and squeeze in a Robbo as well if you trust that or a second Arsenal defender. But as you can already probably tell by this draft, I've gone double Arsenal attack. So that was an incredibly long section on goalkeepers and defenders. Let's move on to those midfielders. So moving on to the midfield, and I'm about to get 500 comments telling me that I am absolutely washed, cooked, and don't know what I'm talking about. But there is no Luis Diaz, and I will discuss that in a second. And it's not because I don't think he's a great option for the next few weeks. I just think that if you see my forward line in a second, you'll understand where the money's gone. But also, I, I just think that there are... Do you know what? Let's just discuss Luis Diaz now. I think Luis Diaz for the next two weeks is fantastic. And I do think that the more that I consider it, I'm like, on a wild card, it may be worth attacking the next couple of weeks. But beyond the next two weeks, Liverpool's fixtures, let me just bring them up so that I can remember. They've got Wolves and Crystal Palace. 
they're okay. Actually, in fact, they're, they're good fixtures based on the way Wolves and Palace have defended this season. But they are both away. We know Liverpool are stronger at Anfield. But I'm not going to argue that those aren't two great fixtures. Luis Diaz has had a full rest midweek. So he is almost guaranteed. In fact, if he's fit, he is guaranteed to start against Wolves away. And Palace away... I think Gakpo will probably start midweek again. So I think Luis Diaz will probably start Palace away. So I think you do get two starts in two for Luis Diaz. And beyond that, you absolutely could continue to see Luis Diaz start. But I've got two issues. Firstly, Slot did mention that in game week four, he was planning to start Gakpo. In fact, he said he wanted to start Gakpo in game week four. But Luis Diaz came back from the international break just looking a little bit fitter and a little bit sharper. And as a result, he started Luis Diaz. That's obviously great news for Luis Diaz's fitness. But it goes to show that as early as game week four, despite Diaz's performance, Gakpo was going to get a start. My other concern now is Gakpo is looking absolutely fantastic. Like he's scoring goals. He's looking sharp. He was player of the tournament, I would say, in the Euros. I don't know if he actually won the award, but he was brilliant for the Netherlands. So we aren't talking about, I think with Jota, I'm not saying that Jota, Jota's less now than Luis Diaz, of course, but Jota's back up is Darwin, who I think is a lot weaker than Gakpo. So Luis Diaz has to keep performing at an insanely high level. And the other thing to note with Luis Diaz, I just need to bring up his minutes. I think he's averaging something like 70 minutes per per appearance. It, again, it's it's not bad, but that's at the peak of his output is he's averaging. So he's got 90, 71, 65, 60, 71. Like even when he is really smashing it, like absolutely undroppable, he's still not getting over 70 minutes really. He's got over 70 minutes on three occasions and two of those were 71. So... Listen, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to chart, start an anti-Diaz propaganda. I'm just giving reasons why I don't think he's like an auto pick. So the next two, great. I think he'll start, he'll probably get a couple of returns. But then in game week eight, they go, then go into Chelsea, Arsenal, Brighton, Villa. They've got Southampton in 12, but then even after that, it's Man City in 13. It's not a very nice run of fixtures. And I do think Gakpo will start to get into the team more and more. So my prediction is that people will have Luis Diaz for the next two and very likely look to move him on from game week eight and beyond, especially if it looks like he might not start after the international break against Chelsea. Now, there's one school of thought that just says, well, yeah, go for him then. You get a Liverpool attacker. He's got Wolves and Palace. He'll score lots of goals and get lots of returns. And if you want to sell him in game week eight, just sell him. And to be honest, if you've got free transfers in the bank, let's say you're wildcarding this week and you had two or three free transfers to use, then I like that. But if you've got one free transfer, I don't like the idea of booking in a transfer in a couple of weeks on top of other issues that you might have in your team. Listen, it, I do understand going for Luis Diaz and I would find it very difficult to go without. I think if I were, it's easy for me to sit here as someone that's not on my wildcard and say, don't pick Luis Diaz. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm just saying, if, if you are sat there and you have doubts, but you're like, oh, I feel like I can't go against him because everyone else has him on wildcard, well, then that's a good opportunity for you. Like, if you're in your heart not so sure, I just wanted to say that, like, everyone's talking about him, like, you have to pick him. I don't see that. I don't see a player that's getting 70 minutes with difficult fixtures coming up in the near future that's a bit of a rotation risk as being desperately essential. So there we go. That's why Diaz isn't in here. And also because of the forward line that I can afford it if I go without him. The other midfield four that are starting for me are all very, very highly owned on those wild cards. And Burmo, people are talking about Burmo like he's essential. No player's essential in FPL, by the way, but I do think he's one of the better picks on wild card. We always talk about what do you want from an asset? You want the minutes, you want the fixtures, you want the penalties, you want possible set pieces, you want that talismanic nature, you want them to share a high quantity of chances for their team, and you want good underlying data and passing the eye test. Like Brian and Burmo does literally have everything you would want from an asset, which is why people say he's essential. And he's also not even that expensive. So yeah, I wouldn't be building a wild card draft without him. But the one thing that we just don't know fully yet is how much might Wissa being out affect Mbermo. Yes, they've got Shardy. Yes, they've got Carvalho. But Wissa has been so critical to the way they play. And his link up with Mbermo has been brilliant as well. Might that re result in a bit of a reduction in Mbermo's output? Potentially. So we have to wait and see on that. So that's the only reason I can really think that you wouldn't want to select Brian and Burmo before back-to-back -back home fixtures against very weak defences. And then even after that, by the way, United, Ipswich, Fulham. The fixtures are a bit of a joke for Burmo, so I would have him. Saka is, again, a very, I say an obvious pick. You could potentially look to go double defence and Havertz, but he's not that expensive. He's 2.7, 2.8 million pound cheaper than Salah. I just think going for Saka on a wild card right now makes sense. Leicester at home, Southampton at home, Bournemouth away. The next three fixtures are very good for the attackers. 
I would say they're better for the attackers than the defenders, which is why I've looked to go double attack here. But yeah, Bakayo Saka is a fantastic option. I would have him. Semenyo. Semenyo, I think, is less important to have than Embermo. So like, if, you, if you've only got one spot left, I know they're very different prices, but I think Embermo is more important because long-term, he's fantastic. Semenyo, my concern is he's got Southampton, Leicester, and then goes into Arsenal, Villa, City. So unless you can bench Semenyo in all three of those, I wouldn't want to play him in any of them. Even the Villa game, I don't think is great. And I know Semenyo did get a goal ruled out against Liverpool, by the way, so he can score in those big games. But you don't ideally want to be starting an asset against Arsenal, Villa, and City. So... What I've done here as a result is I've got McNeil on the bench. So I've got Semenyo and McNeil. And I've spoke about the fact that I, I've, again, you probably think, but Ross, you've said you don't love McNeil because of his goal threat. I don't. I don't love the fact that McNeil doesn't carry much goal threat, but his assist threat continues to be an absolute joke. He's got over 0.6 expected assist. So he will still get you returns and he'll still get you points and he'll still tick along. And also he can still score goals, by the way. He's just not going to get you many goals. But what I love is that fixture rotation. So you start Semenyo for Southampton and Leicester. And then when he goes into Arsenal, Villa, City, McNeil has Ipswich, Fulham. I can't even see the fixture. It's too small there. Let me grab the fixtures up here. So he'll go into Ipswich, Fulham, Southampton. I mean, they are three exceptional fixtures. And then after that, Semenyo, McNeil, Rogers, you can decide who you want to play. So that's why I like McNeil in this team. Because Semenyo and McNeil rotate really nicely and you can bench Semenyo for those slightly trickier fixtures. And that would mean that you play Rodgers pretty much every week. But I think Rodgers is still great. He's got the minutes. He's playing for a very good attack. The fixtures are there to some extent. Like the next four fixtures are all pretty good for him. I really don't mind the idea of going for a Rodgers. I know maybe I wouldn't be saying this if he hadn't got the two assists last week and if he was still continuing to blank, but he didn't blank. And also I think he's been unlucky to not get something to date. He's created two big chances. He's had two big chances himself. That was even before the game in game week five. I think he's now up to three or four big chances created. He's doing pretty well for himself. The underlying data is not fantastic, but for his price to allow you to squeeze in the other assets, Rogers feels like a great pick. So yeah, I think that midfield five, it does look weak. Like when you look at it, you think sack is your premium. There's no Salah, obviously. You've got no Liverpool. And then your next most expensive is in Burma. And then you've got three very cheap midfielders. So in terms of price points and structure, I do agree that it is a little bit weak. But the only difference to most other people is rather than McNeil, they've got Luis Diaz. The, the template midfield five is in Burma, Saka, Rogers, Semenyo, Diaz. So I've just dropped Diaz to McNeil, put McNeil on the bench, and it's allowed me to have three very, very, very good forwards. Obviously, let me know what you think of that down below. Like most people probably disagree, and that's fair. Like, go and pick Luis Diaz. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you not to. I'm just saying there are multiple ways to structure a team. No one is essential. So let's take a look at that front three. So guys, moving on to the forwards, and you can probably see now where all of the money is at. And if you've just skipped to this point of the video, shame on you, but make sure to like and subscribe if you have done that. I know people do it. They'll see the timestamps down below and they'll go, I'll skip to the forwards and just look at, no, watch the whole video because you need the whole justification. But if you have just skipped, like I said, make sure to like and subscribe. So the front three is where all the money is at. And I know a lot of people won't like this sort of top heavy team, this top heavy approach. And I understand it. Because midfielders do often score the most points given they get the extra point for the goal and the extra point for the clean sheet. I often say that I prefer a 3-5-2. And the other thing to note is there are really good cheap forwards that we'll discuss in a second. So I can understand all of the justification for not going top heavy. But that almost says to me then that there is the possibility to really gain on those around you. Because again, I'm not going different for the sake of it. But these expensive forwards are exceptionally good value. Like, they really are. Like, Watkins and Havertz, we'll discuss in a second, they are such good value. But because people want to squeeze in Diaz, they might want to go double Arsenal offense. Like, they just won't even be able to get close to affording both of these. Some people, in fact, most people I've seen, probably won't even be able to afford one of the two of Havertz and Watkins. So considering the rest of the team is so strong, I don't feel like I'm sacrificing much elsewhere other than the fact that I don't have a Liverpool attacker, which you could see as a huge disadvantage. I'm able to get pretty much everything I want, plus having two really, really good forwards. So let's start with Erling Haaland. I was so tempted, almost as like a, a joke, to put out a wildcard draft without Haaland, just to see how upset people would be. But obviously, even I'm not silly enough to go without Haaland for this spell here. Newcastle's a great fixture this week. But then from game week seven, it's Fulham, Wolves, Southampton, Bournemouth. Like, you don't want to go with... Haaland is an auto-captain, probably, for the next four or five weeks. It's sad to say... But unless we see a drop off from him, and to be honest, I'm buying him next week, so he probably will drop off and start blanking. But unless we do start to see consecutively poor performances, he does feel like a bit of an auto-captain for the upcoming game week, sadly. But 
it is what it is. And sometimes this happens in FPL where you just have a player that is that good that you just have to captain them. So Haaland is obviously in here. I should just note there is no Mohamed Salah. People say, why are you dropping? Like, how are you getting Salah into this team? I mean, you could drop Watkins all the way down, Havertz all the way down, and then you could upgrade Saka, or you could look to go much cheaper in defense and lose Trent, but you have to sacrifice somewhere. And given the fact that I think there are other good assets for quite a bit cheaper, Salah sadly has to be the one that makes way. But if you can squeeze him in, I absolutely love it. So the other two players, Watkins and Havertz, I'll start with Havertz. I just think with the slight doubts around Raya at the time being recorded in this, and also given the fixtures, I think Havertz might be the slightly higher upside pick because... Even if Rai is available, like I said, I don't see many saves over the next three weeks particularly. So let's say you get like six, six, seven, which is three clean sheets in a row, which I still think is statistically quite improbable. And you get maybe one save point at one point. That's still less than 20 points you're getting in total there. So, sorry, I was just doing mental math. That's 19 points you'd get. Havertz, if he grabs a brace and one assist along with appearance points, so you're probably looking at over that. And could Havertz get more than three attacking returns in the next three? I would hope so, absolutely. I think Havertz will outscore right. And of course, they are in different positions and at different prices. And on top of that, you're not building a wildcard draft for the next two or three weeks. Like, I understand all of that. But I do like the idea of attacking the next two or three of Havertz. And the other reason I like Havertz is it's 8.1 million. You have a really good exit route to Solanke and Jackson at a slightly cheaper price. Free up about 0 0.5, 0 0.4 million. And I think both Solanke and Jackson are arguably close to being as good as Havertz as assets. And I, I think that around game week eight, a lot of people will be looking to move to Solanke. You could just start with Solanke and go for double Arsenal defense. And that's what most people are doing. And I don't necessarily mind it. But I think the upside is there to attack with Havertz. And then you have the option, do you want Solanke? Do you want Jackson? Or do you want to skip those more expensive forwards altogether? Free up some funds to get back to a Salah. And you can downgrade Havertz all the way to a cheaper forward. So... I like the price point of Havertz. I like the fixtures. I like the upside. I think he's a very nice option. And then Ollie Watkins is in there. I've not seen Ollie Watkins in, I would say, a single wildcard draft. He's been in a few, but he is someone that is being completely overlooked on wildcard. And the reason for that is he's very expensive. And if you want Saka, you want Diaz, maybe you do want Havertz in there or you want other expensive assets. Maybe you want double Arsenal defense. You want Trent. You want Gvardiol. Like, you can't afford everyone. And what, Ollie Watkins is extremely expensive. So I can fully understand why. But he's also brilliant. He plays Ipswich this week, which looks like it could have huge upside. He's had 10 big chances in the opening five weeks. The same number as Erling Haaland. And I know Erling Haaland is a better finisher playing for a better team, etc., etc. And big chances isn't the best metric to use. But Haaland has been getting so many chances. That we've been speaking, like, how many chances he had? Ollie Watkins had the same number of big chances. And also, you have to remember, Watkins' minutes have not been particularly good up to this point. And I use that as a positive because it goes to in far fewer minutes, Watkins has accumulated the same number of big chances as Haaland. And also, Aston Villa's fixtures to this point, they've been okay, but they've not been brilliant. They played against Arsenal one of the games. So listen, I think Watkins is really, really good. And if I can find a way next week to still have him, I'd like to do so because he is incredibly nailed. The fixtures are still good for Aston Villa, even beyond the Ipswich game. And he just is such a reliable asset to have. And because he's at that tricky price point, so many other people will look to go without him. So it's an extremely expensive forward line. And I can fully understand why people wouldn't want to invest that much money in it. But I also feel like it has huge upside with Havertz and Watkins against Leicester and Ipswich, two players that I don't think I'm seeing in a lot of teams. Like when I look at this team in its entirety, it doesn't feel like I'm sacrificing. But I do understand that the big one would be Luis Diaz. So what can you do about that? If you just want to go from McNeil to Lewis Diaz, all you have to do is probably drop Ollie Watkins, right? If that's the position you want to do and just go for a 3-5-2, and I still think that's a very, very strong team at that point. So by all means, look to bring in Lewis Diaz. I don't mind it, but it just means that you lose Watkins. And when I say Watkins versus Diaz, I'd prefer to have Ollie Watkins, but I understand he's also slightly more expensive. So that has to be taken into account. It's not just a straight shoot up between the two of them. But that's the team. I did just want to say, obviously the... Cheap forwards for me would be the the real reason to not go for a wild card like this. And I do think that they are like, if I look at that team, something that I always say is penalty takers, penalty takers, penalty takers. And I've gone for Havertz and Watkins rather than like, you could get Wood and Calvert-Lewin. Both are cheap, both run pens. And even Solanke might take a share of penalties for Spurs as well. So I love Calvert-Lewin. I think Calvert-Lewin's fantastic. I already have McNeil in there. So I didn't necessarily love the idea of in some weeks having two Everton attackers, despite the fact that they've actually attacked fairly well. Like the fixtures are absolutely there, by the way, for Everton. So 
Calvert-Lewin, I think he's a fine pick. He's in my own team, but I know a lot of people aren't as keen. And Chris Wood took a penalty, obviously, for Forrest. The underlying data has been pretty good. 0.55 XG per 90. That does take into account penalties. So it's more like 0.5 XG per 90, which is still good. And the fixtures are there to attack. Fulham, Chelsea, Palace, Leicester, West Ham, Newcastle, Ipswich in there as well. Like Up until around game week 11, they're, they're good fixtures for Nottingham Forest. So like maybe the slightly more optimal team and optimal formation is to just drop one of Watkins and Havertz to a cheaper forward like Wood, like Calvert-Lewin. And that would obviously free up the funds for you to then bring in a Luis Diaz. But I just wanted to present something slightly different. And I think this has potential to go absolutely massive, not only this week, but also in coming weeks as well. Like next week, Havertz has Southampton at home, Watkins has Man United at home. Two home fixtures for both of them and, and really good fixtures to, to, to attack as well. So yeah, that is the team in its entirety. Like I said, I am currently zero points off being able to afford this. If you also are, Pickford down to Flecken is probably the most obvious spot to downgrade. And after that, Dwight McNeil to someone like Tyler Dibbling would give you lots of money. Or I wouldn't recommend this, but Mikalenko down to like a Harwood Bell. Not even Harwood Bellis isn't great. I mean, like fast, someone that's going to play good minutes at a slightly cheaper price. That would give you some funds as well. I wouldn't downgrade any of the other spots for me. So in terms of who would be like locked in on a wild card for me if I was doing it this week, Gabriel Trent, Embermo, Rogers. I think I'd have Semenyo, Saka, and Haaland. So like seven of the spots, they are going to be very similar amongst a, amongst a lot of teams. But that final 4.5 defender, the goalkeeper, one or two of your forwards, I think these are the positions that you can start to differentiate slightly. So that is the Game Week 6 wildcard. Let me know what you think of it down below in the comments. So guys, there you have it. That is my Game Week 6 wildcard draft. Hopefully this was helpful for those of you on wildcard. And if you did enjoy today's video, please do smash that like button and make sure to subscribe as well if you are new. And also make sure to check out my video later, which will be my deadline decisions video this afternoon. Until next time, thank you very much. Bye-bye.